You good to roll? Yeah, we're good. Cool. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm so bad at opening these. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just let Daniel take the wheel. He's so much better at it. He's he's got a a decade on me. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Android Police Podcast for, uh, well, we're recording it on October 18th, 2024. I am, as always, uh, Will Saddleberg here, hosting in place of the great, formidable Daniel Bader. Joining me this week, back on the show for the first, I don't know, two months, probably? It's been a couple months? Yeah. Not, not super long. August. Yeah. Android Police uh, Editor-in-Chief, James Beckham. Hi, James. Hello. Hi, this is my first time doing the video one, so this is this is. I know, I had this thought, yeah, I had this thought this morning of like, oh man, people are going to finally know what James looks like. That's crazy. (laughs) Rather than that one, rather than that one header image that I have across the site. Yeah, now to be fair, you pretty much look like you're like, especially right now, like how you are positioned, it does kind of just look like the photos (laughs) speaking. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's not... (laughs) Well, I was hoping this would be proof that I'm not an AI because I know there was chatter yeah. at one point about me being an AI, uh, an AI replacement for Daniel sort of thing. So um, <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe this is not going to do what I thought it was. I, maybe it's just going to be incredibly good video technology version of me. Yeah. So I, I do need every listener or, or viewer really to like go through and like look for the little errors in James's AI video, <laughs> because of course, like if he if he grows a third eye at any point, like let us know, like we're still demoing. <laughs> James, you know, like it's it's uh no, he's real. I've 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 met him in person twice. He's real. That's how good the AI is that you <laughs> Or yeah, or shockingly advanced. Like you were it turns <laughs> out uh those Elon robots were farther along than we thought. <laughs> uh this week on the show, we're talking uh Android 15. Uh mm. or maybe not. Like I don't know, like we'll see how long we can talk about it for. <laughs> uh no, I'm kidding. It's it's Android 15 week. If you have a Pixel device, you probably have it. If you don't have a Pixel device, see you in 2025, it sounds like, uh, it would be my guess. I, that might be okay. Like, you might not be missing out on a ton. We've got some Samsung stuff. We've got a couple of reviews. I reviewed the Galaxy Tab S10 Plus. Steven Rodokia reviewed the Galaxy S24 FE for us and honestly gave it a much more positive review than I would have mm. expected. And And I wrote a little quick post about it yesterday, acknowledging that, like, my big problem with that phone is already kind of fixed if you look at carrier deals. We are getting the Galaxy Z Fold Special Edition this month, it sounds like. Well, not we. Some, maybe some people, some but not them. us. Yeah, yeah, not us, though. And there's a, a weird uh, settings rumor for Samsung phones that we honestly might be the most interesting story of the week i I, think i think so too yeah let's let's get let's get there at some point because it's um yeah it's bizarre yeah oh yeah and then a whole grab bag we'll we'll see what we get to um we might have to talk about elon musk again sorry uh for the (laughs) double mention but uh yeah we'll get there james android Mm. 15 have you have you upgraded yeah, I've partaken in Android 15. Um, <laughs> downloaded it on Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, it's it's working all right. There's not a huge amount of problems. It is not the most exciting update in the world. Um, as as you probably already know, if you have a Pixel Six yeah. or beyond, you probably already downloaded this. If you haven't, go to your settings. You should be able to get it. It's slight this year. We've had a few years of this now. Ever since what Android 12 was probably the last time we saw an absolute huge overhaul in that sort of way. Android 14 was a similar sort of deal last year, but I, even then. I think there was a little bit more to talk about within Android 14. Android is just that good now that it's really, really difficult to make a huge, big step up. There are a couple of key features I want to talk through today on this that that I think are, again, worth upgrading, always worth being on the latest software for that. There are some yeah. cool features there. But we we tried to review it this week, and it's a, it's a difficult thing to review now because it is... Yeah. Yeah. And like... Uh, and if we just jump straight into that, like um, Taylor Kearns, our Google editor on the site, in his review noted that one of the positives is that there is actually a very slim learning curve now. Like when you upgrade yeah. your phone software, you probably know how to keep continuing to use your phone. You're not going to have to relearn anything. You're not going to have to change anything major. He put that as a positive in the review, and I t- totally agree with him. It's just strange that we're now at that point where one of the positives that we're saying in a review is something that is lacking in a way like it's um yeah. it's an interesting interesting move in that way yeah it's i was on the android subreddit this week i was on the, the mm. pixel subreddit this week and it's interesting seeing 
more regular users, still enthusiasts, of course, you're not on those subreddits if you're not at least a little bit of an enthusiast, but people who are not going to upgrade their every day, you know, their daily drivers to beta software being like, huh, this is it, right? Okay. But I do think if you talk to regular people in your life, like not like truly non-enthusiasts, just they own a phone that you have to talk to them about. Well, even even iPhone owners, really, like mm. a lot of the iPhone owners in my life, right? Like iOS rolls out to everyone at the same time, assuming they're not running like a six year old device. I know a lot of people in my life who are like, yeah, I'll, I'll upgrade eventually. Like, I'll, I'll get there. I they, they do it months down the road. It, to be honest, like the thing that I think drives iOS upgrades more than anything is like, wait, I don't have that emoji. I want that emoji, <laughs> which is like <laughs> funny in a way, but also shows what what features people really care about. And I think Android 15 kind of reflects that of like, look, we're not here to like revolutionize anything. Your pixel is still mm-hmm. going to feel like it felt yesterday, but there will be a few new upgrades in here. And, you know, some of the more user facing stuff will come in QPR one, which I think is like, honestly, kind of the bigger story here, which is that like, yeah. Android 15, you know, this has been a slow march, but kind of marks, I think, the official death of being truly excited about a new build of Android, unless you are like a developer playing Mm. with APIs, right? Like it's, if you are looking for your phone to feel different tomorrow than it does today, you're going to be more excited about features pushed through play services or just app upgrades in general, like, like, oh, we rolled out like changes to the dialer, right? Like all of that stuff Mm. is handled outside of android 15 which is not true on the iphone right so like when ios 18 comes out everyone suddenly has like all of these theming options that weren't there yesterday and that's not true for android just it's a different strategy yeah i i I entirely agree yeah i think you're right this is the moment where that changes i think like it's been a slow slow time to get there it's been a few years of getting there i feel i feel like we're there now i think december is going to be more interesting than it would have been this time last year or or in in that sort of way and i i think you know part of it is that android a new version of android right by which i mean a numbered version 13 14 15 usually launches within a month of a new ios build right which makes people excited and i think there is a certain level of expectation of like well they got theirs i want mine and I get why people might be disappointed from that of like, you know, private space is cool, but it's not enough stuff like that. But I do think like if you are that person who wants new features all the time, like to a certain extent, Google changing how Android works and being like, and I'm, I'm mostly talking specifically Pixel here, but obviously Play Services affects every Android phone being like, well, no, like the big build matters less. That's more for developers now, but you're going to get new features every three months. Like. That is more exciting in a way. Like I, I do think there you yeah. do need to remind yourself that like, okay, like the October push was boring. The December push will be cool. Yeah. It's just it's just a change though, isn't it? It's just a change. We're so used to getting to this point of the year or even a little bit earlier in the year and being like, new features. We're excited. Let's talk about them lots when it's this year. Again, we we still we've managed to identify at least nine new features within the actual software itself. I think we've got even more than that within our uh, our Magnum Opus hub that uh, that Taylor looks after. So if you're interested in every single little bit of Android 15, we're not going to talk about that on the podcast today. Go to go to our um, homepage and and look for the Android 15 hub from there, or just or Google android 15, android 15 uh android police and you'll be able to find it um yeah so there are there are elements here but it's yeah as as we keep saying it's not it's not a huge overhaul but you know i don't know i um we also got like a few new pixel features and that's kind of the other mm. side of it right is that like so much of what we think about android is is now a pixel thing right like there is no phone really running stock android anymore like the nexus devices did for a decade or seven or eight years or whatever pixels sort of kind of did right like it was like oh they've got like a slightly different launcher for the first couple of generations and then you know forked hard left i would say and so like the other thing to remember with all of this is that like android has truly become a base that oems including google are going to build off of that was always true but it's more true than ever now that like google is also doing this with their own pixel ecosystem all of this is a play for for ecosystem control and that's true for google google and wow uh it's friday (laughs) yeah i don't know like i i think like it's time to think differently about how this stuff rolls out and and 
remind yourself that if you're not a developer or developer minded, it's going to be a little more boring than it might have been in the past. But like the other side of this is that like we know Oxygen OS 15 is getting announced next week. We know mm. um, One UI 7 has been teased as this huge overhaul and we're going to talk about the settings thing. All of these companies are maybe not because of how boring Android up- upgrades are, but like maybe just that's giving them the opportunity to experiment a little more with what they want the future of their software to be. That does make the future a little more interesting. It's just, it might not be interesting to everyone. It's going to be interesting because it's launching on the phone you have or the phone you want, not every mm. Android phone, and you'll get it eventually if you have a Samsung device or something. Yeah, I think there's also a bit of privilege there as well. It's exciting to us in the sense that we try all of these phones out when you are making one <laughs> phone purchase. When you're making one phone purchase every three or four years, yeah, that's a that's a frustrating element, is it? When when something is being tried out new in some area that you're that you're not going to necessarily get access to. Well, and also like I suppose I hadn't thought about that, but like if you bought a Galaxy S24 because you liked One UI mm-hmm. five or One UI six, I'm, I'm going to say One UI five because they they work so close together. Um, yeah. you know, you might not like One UI 7. That might be a bit of a bummer. Some of those left swings, it's a risk, right? Like it's, yeah. if if all of these companies are going to be like, well, you know what? We're just going to try new stuff. Like that might piss off your existing audience. Um, mm. It's much easier, James, for you and I to be like, I don't like One UI 7. I'm going back to a Pixel and then yeah. take out a phone from a bin in our closet or whatever. <laughs> That's not true for normal people. Like, yeah, I, and, and just to confirm, I do not keep any phones in a bin. Just so, just so you. Can, all right, I'm speaking so from. Uh, I'm speaking from from from. Ex- I keep. Uh, uh, I I have I have totes. I have totes. I'll say that. <laughs> so many totes. I, um, I, I, listen, a lot of phones. I need to. I need to give some away. I need to find people. If you want a phone, I was gonna say tweet at me, but I, my account's on private now. So uh, <laughs> we're getting to that in a moment. Me. Yeah. <laughs> um. I do. I do want to talk a little bit about some of the features that come in the Android 15. We we spoke yeah, about yeah, no, no, and and I think private space especially is yeah. is worth diving into. So tell us a little bit about. Uh, let's start with private space. Tell us a little bit. Yeah, about that. it is the it's the most consumer friendly element of Android 15, isn't it? It's the yeah. it's the thing that you explain to someone over over a beer or or over a coffee, and they go, "Oh, I can actually see a use for that." So private space is a similar sort of element to Samsung Secure Folder or or um, the Android elements of Secure Folder as well. Um, so you're able to lock away media on your phone. That's how that works within Samsung Secure Folder. So if you need to lock away certain photos, certain files, anything like that, and password protect them so no one could accidentally find them whenever they're scrolling through your gallery or anything like that, you hand your phone over to them. This is for the entire software, essentially, for Android. So you can set up an entirely new Google profile. You can have apps downloaded specifically just to private space. So if you have a specific scenario where you need to have one app on your phone that you don't want anyone else who may have access to your device to be able to spot, then you can have that locked away within there. The thing we continue to hear about this, uh, so WhatsApp had a similar feature, I think it was about a year ago or so, where they brought out chat, chat lock, um, where you're yeah. able to lock one of lock specifically one of your chats away. And there's literally no no sign on the UI that you have any locked chats unless you know a specific gesture to be able to find them. And then you're able to unlock your phone with biometrics or a password or whatever you've chosen to do that. So you can hide those chats away. Part of WhatsApp's campaign for that was they were using the example of domestic abuse victims. So whenever anyone was, someone may have coercive control over their phone or anything like that, if you needed to have that sort of security, you can, and you can lock these things away. So that's a huge element of private space of something that you can do with that. If you need to have a specific messaging app that you don't want someone who is able to control your phone or anything like that to know you have access to, that's brilliant. Very rare scenario in that for that to come up, but that is a fantastic, good feature to have within it. Again, this messaging just needs to get out to those sort of people that need that access to it. But I do also think it's probably helpful just for the average person as well. Last year, I was planning a relatively big birthday for my partner and trying to make sure she didn't spot anything within my WhatsApp messages was really, really difficult. Um, I was trying to organize a surprise birthday party at the same time as trying to do an engagement as well. Um, So that was a really difficult thing to do. So I was trying to lock both of those WhatsApp chats down. If I had this private space element within my phone, I think that would be really helpful 
helpful for me for planning something like that. So right. I think there are there are elements of that. Um, me and Taylor, Google editor, were talking earlier in the week as well around this, and he was bringing up an example of like if you have a particularly addictive game that you find addictive, and you have kids that you don't want to have access to that game, you can also use that feature for that as well. So it can be it can be used for a variety of different things. I see kids grabbing phones and just being able to open up every single app possible. If there is something you particularly want to hide in that way for any reason like that, I think this is a huge benefit. Have you played around with it yet? A little bit. It, it, it The reason I haven't is because I want to, and this is kind of, I'm hoping this is the start of this, right? Because private space adds a, a space within the app drawer. And I've been thinking a lot about this because I've been bouncing back and forth between a lot of different devices from different OEMs, right? Which, which, as I just said, like more than ever feels like very different flavors of Android. And I want to write something about how I think it's time mm. for Google to rethink the app drawer experience and make it more customizable. If they want, and they've made it clear throughout this year that they want people to use more apps more often. And I think the app drawer is not a particularly good way to do that in its current state. I think practically every other OEM allows you to customize it a lot more than, than I mean, it's, it's hard to customize it less, to be honest. And so I, I think private space is a good first step in a way, right? Because it is this own special spot within the app drawer that I'm hoping is like the key to unlocking, you know, I don't necessarily need it to be as convoluted as I think One UI's app drawer can be, mm. but I do think adding options and making them, you know, turning them off by default, keeping it a standard alphabetical vertical app drawer is a good place to keep most people. But like for power users, you know, I, at this point, like I almost find the iOS app library, which is bad, like more usable than yeah. uh, the app drawer for finding apps, which is, you know, I don't know. Like it's, I think it says something about how many apps I'm using, like that I, I have, mm. I have slowly started to use more apps over the last year um, after paring down quite a bit over the last like half decade but i don't know so that's that's kind of where i am i'm kind of trying to not play with private space until i can write that piece a, a, a lot or i want to at least get my thoughts down on the app drawer first as it stands like as a stock app drawer i suppose but mm. yeah i don't know i'm hopeful that that as much as this is about privacy and safety it's also maybe google thinking about ways that they can play around with how you organize your apps mm. I think one of the interesting elements of it is that Google is actively asking you to set up a new Google account for this as well, which I, I just find yeah. a curious a curious element for this. So it, it part of the process is essentially saying set up a brand new Google account and you have an entirely different section in your phone for that. Um, I don't remember them ever really recommending having multiple accounts before. This feels like the first time I've ever really actively seen that. Yeah, I hope that's be that that has changed to optional in the future. Yeah. Me too. QPR launch basically like I, I don't think everyone needs that like you know iOS has a similar feature on iOS I think it was just added in iOS 18 I don't know I've been on the beta for a while that allows you to like hide and, and secure apps behind face ID and like you don't need to set up a separate like I don't know you wouldn't they, they wouldn't ask you to set up a separate Apple account but like I think it makes it a lot easier and I think that's a, a hurdle that some people might not cross is the other thing yeah yeah definitely if you're setting that up that's going to be an irritating stop isn't it um what else uh interests you about android 15 what what have you been what have Slim. you noticed i suppose what have i noticed that is genuinely the first this is the first time i've upgraded to a new version of android and not noticed anything instantly i think yeah. that, that that is really the big takeaway here you have to go searching and digging to find these features um in my newsletter this week that goes out on sunday if you're not already signed up please uh please go and do that on the android police newsletter webpage. i'm talking about the exact same thing of it just be, this being the time where it's not you're just not finding anything instantly within there. Um, I think theft detection on, uh, lock is probably one of the other most exciting consumer facing features within it. So this is a way that the phone is able to notice when the specific motions are going, like the phone goes through whenever someone rides by you on a bike and tries to snatch your phone out of your hand, tries to keep it unlocked. And when it notices that, it will then lock the phone. So you're not talking about a full blown reset or anything to the phone. It's just going to turn the lock screen on. Um, 
I've not yet played around with that all that much. It's quite difficult to actually replicate that. And uh, we probably need to do that in the near future. But the, I, I live relatively near to London and it is a really, I've heard many, many cases of that happening to people. I think I read a stat recently where it was like every six minutes, someone in London manages to have their phone stolen in a similar sort of way. It's a worthwhile yeah. feature in, in that way. I'm just interested to see how it actually works in practice and uh, and how well it works for that. Yeah, I want to say Taylor told me he was having trouble getting it Replicate. to like recognize that the phone is being taken. Yeah, yeah, and so it's not a feature you can really rely on in that way. But right. anything, anything in those scenarios, I think, is better than nothing, isn't it? And, um, and yeah. one of the other big elements of that is when it identifies anything like the idea of a robbery and then someone tries to turn the internet off, it will instantly lock down at that point, which I think is actually probably a smarter thing there because it's quite difficult to tell from when a device falls off a table compared to when a device is snatched out of a hand. I think that's a clear element. If someone's trying to turn your internet off, they're probably doing it for nefarious means. I want to call out, uh, these are like barely new, to be honest, <laughs> expand in a second. But yeah. um, uh, there are a couple of uh, changes on foldables and, and tablets, yep. now, obviously. That really only applies to like the Pixel tablet and the original Pixel Fold. But I am happy to see that they have expanded beyond the Pixel 9 Pro Fold. It's app pairs, which, you know, has, has I want to say, has been in testing going back to Android 13. It was, was I, I think, supposed to be on the Pixel Fold and just dragged on. That was a big problem with the software of that device. It was backported to Android 14 on the Pixel 9 Pro Fold. It's now live on the original Pixel Fold with this upgrade. So if you are an OG Pixel Fold user, that is actually a big change for you and, and genuinely will make that phone a lot more useful. Same goes for the ability to pin the taskbar on the bottom. That is uh, a thing Samsung has had forever on their devices. Um, it's a little a little finicky. It's not quite uh as as like easy to use as samsung's i found like i the t to be honest with you i haven't used the pixel 9 pro fold in about a month and i couldn't off the top of my head remember how to do it i think you press and hold on the app dock button but do not quote me on that a little weird but uh i don't know those are both nice features again they were already on the pixel 9 pro fold now they are rolling back to older devices and will be on you know if they make a pixel tablet too it'll be there yeah other small things, predictive um, predictive gestures, been a thing since Android 14, but wasn't on by default, and now is on by default across everything. Yeah. I'm struggling to think of the other elements now. Uh, the blue, <laughs> the Bluetooth, the Bluetooth toggle element, I think, is quite interesting as well. If you turn your Bluetooth yeah. off and you forget to turn it on by the next day, something I do on a really, really regular basis. Um, I've yet to do it this week. Annoyingly, that would be a great example of it, but I have done it for for this exact moment. So uh, uh, let's see if it works overnight. But um, the idea is, if you turn Bluetooth off for any particular reason, you try and disconnect from a pair of headphones or something like that, and you forget to turn it on by the next day, your phone will automatically turn it on. Uh, at a later date i'm not really sure what the timing or anything works there whether it's like a you taking the phone off charge or anything like that yeah i'm not have you played around with that yet uh no but it's it's uh uh it's one of those changes that like has been on ios for a while and i'm yeah. like kind of pleased to see it here i know some people don't love auto on for bluetooth and, and wi-fi they want full control over whether it's on or off it, it, to your exactly what you said if i'm turning off wi-fi or bluetooth on my device it is i i'm gonna say 99 percent. i'm gonna allow myself a little bit of wiggle room but 99 percent of the time it is for exactly what you said it is because i'm either like i'm about to leave right I'm, i want my phone to disconnect from my weak wi-fi signal while i'm pulling my truck out of the garage or it's like i don't want to be connected to my pair of headphones anymore it is not because like i never want to use bluetooth so like yeah. i'm i'm happy to see this here i think they're useful quality of life features but yeah it's difficult to get really excited about um yeah. and i think the final That's thing okay. yeah the one the one final thing i'd still talk about is um third-party wallet apps you can now use that for NFC, yeah. nfc payments as well so previously your phone would always default to google wallet you can now play around with the default of that as well very very minor thing i think only some power users are going to find this useful in particular examples but worth a yeah. a uh, ten second shout out on this pod, yeah. Especially with how much we've talked about um, Google's monopoly cases in the yeah. last month or two, yeah. uh, it is uh, it is it it feels a little bit uh, angled towards that. I think so too. And that's kind of it. I think mm -hmm. I think we can leave Android 
15 there for now yeah. i think we may sound negative but but download it anyway yeah. like, not at all I, it's yeah. not a bad update yeah, yeah. 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 it's it's, it's a good update. just <laughs> yeah like it doesn't seem buggy i i i haven't seen okay I, that's not true i've seen a few complaints on yeah. on reddit but what, what what else is new um <laughs> you know but like for the most part it seems like people are fairly fine with it i haven't seen any like truly you know uh experience breaking bugs it's mostly smaller stuff like still some weirdness with back gestures and and whatnot but nothing yeah nothing crazy as, as we're recording this we're, we're writing a story at the moment from a bunch of reddit reports of a similar sort of thing of um pixel 8 handsets particularly are having a problem with that at the moment so as ever with any android update we are seeing issues for that i'd say this is probably one of the smoothest yet let's talk about samsung mm. a weird week for samsung i suppose we've reviewed their two big new fall uh devices i would say fall 2024 devices which is a i think um a weird lineup i know we talked about on the show previously and then a couple of rumors and in reports that we should get into really quickly we can talk about my galaxy tab s10 plus review i we i want to say we touched on it a little bit last week but i forget what we talked about on this podcast the second i stop recording so uh now that the review is live it'll be in the show notes it's a good tablet that I have a hard time recommending to people because it's a thousand dollars. It changes very little over its predecessor. And while I was writing this review, um, it's not anymore, but while I was writing this review during Amazon's Prime Day sale and then a couple of days after, the Tab S9 Plus, which again, a very similar tablet, was seven hundred and fifty dollars. So so you were saving two hundred and fifty bucks and getting almost an identical experience as we move into the holiday season i expect that sale to come back i expect it to be somewhere between 700 and 750 dollars for the uh the tab s9 plus and for saving 250 to 300 dollars you will lose the anti-glare finish on the display which is nice but not a must-have you'll get a slightly older processor but this is one of the one of the few reviews i've ever uh, shared benchmarks in and as you can see it's they're very similar benchmarks. This, the Snapdragon yeah. 8 Gen 2 and the Tab S9 Plus is perfectly adequate in 2020. Uh, we'll go forward, 2025. And it's the same design to the point where, you know, the Tab S9 Plus keyboard works with the Tab S10 Plus. I have a difficult time knowing why this exists beyond Samsung wanting to switch to MediaTek chipsets because, and this is... Yeah speculation on my part this is not confirmed but i i do believe that they are cheaper than than qualcomm chips and so samsung is probably saving some money on the margins of of selling this tablet it is not being passed on to you is what i would say yeah that is all speculation but i can't see 100 percent speculation yeah yeah but um it's not a bad tablet though if you you know mm. that's the other problem is that the thousand dollar space for laptops and tablets is quite different uh, than it was this time last year when the Tab S9 series launched. And if you're looking for a device that is kind of like a small and light laptop or tablet, like most of the Snapdragon X Elite or Plus powered devices start around $1,000. You can get the latest uh, Surface laptop starts at $1,000. And I know that some people truly just want a tablet and the Surface duo also starts at a thousand but for the x plus version but like i just have a hard time recommending a thousand dollar android tablet when a thousand dollar windows laptop will do a lot more mm. now you've reviewed this product is it any clearer now why there isn't an s10 or why samsung chose to revamp the ultra and the plus compared to the compared to the s9 yeah i, I so i don't know sales numbers it could be that no one was really buying the, the tab s9 which is what i reviewed last year I do mm. have a, a thought, which is, I, I think it might have something to do with the, the, the aspect ratio, weirdly. Having now reviewed the Tab S9, actually the Tab S8, but the Tab S9, so the 11-inch model from last year, which is still on sale, still the current 11-inch version, and the Tab S10 Plus, the 12.4-inch one, because of the 16-10 aspect ratio versus like a, a more square device like the iPad or the OnePlus Pad, uh pad no yes yeah what One yeah plus pad. right jeez it just feels <laughs> wrong like i said mm. it and i was like that's not right yeah it's too close to ipad they wouldn't do that no, they, uh, would. <laughs> they did uh they twice they, uh and there was a yeah. mini one uh 
Uh, yeah. So I think what it is is that when I hold it up next to an 11 inch or 10.9 inch, whatever Air or or um, Pro mm. uh, for the iPad in landscape, they're about the same height, like relatively. Obviously, you get more width with the Tab S10 Plus because it is a 1610 device. And so my guess is that like as much as 12.4 inches sounds big, it doesn't feel as big as like the 13 inch iPad Pro because of that aspect ratio. So my thinking is that like they might see this as more of like the mainstream size in a way, even though it is so tall because it's just small enough that you can use it in portrait mode without it feeling too awkward. I, that is not true for the 15 inch one. No. And no, it's not. And and our review on that is is forthcoming. Hmm. But yeah, I think that's basically it. I think they see it as like, look, get the same height again in landscape as an iPad. And then you get a little extra on the side. And so if you're watching video, if you've got it in the keyboard dock and you're using it like a laptop, you know, you've got a little more space and that feels that does feel comfortable. Like um the CMS Android Place uses uh, to publish is kind of it's not great on smaller displays. Yeah, it it, it really benefits f- f- no, from a from a it benefits from a larger screen. Is that is that fair to say, James? Yeah. And this device is the first tablet I've ever used it on where I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, this fits. Like this, it, and it is because of the extra space you get on the left and right side of the screen. Mm. So that's nice. Like I'm going to Snapdragon Summit for to cover Qualcomm's event next week, and like I'm bringing my laptop, of course, because again, <laughs> Windows does a lot yeah. more than android it just does especially for my job but like i'm taking this tablet with me and part of it is because like i think this is kind of perfect for like working on the plane in a mm. way that like tab s8 which i took to snapdragon summit two years ago was not it, it just didn't feel right i can't imagine using an ultra on a plane like I, I, no I, don't i've only, no. I've I only used the ultra for what like 10 minutes the s10 ultra i've used previous ones yeah. but yes the s10 ultra is i've only used for about 10 minutes um and it, yeah i can't can't imagine that of uh i'd be so nervous someone was going to lean back on their chair or something and that that thing would get that thing would get mangled. it's too big yeah, yeah. But that's kind of how I feel about when I, when I, you know, I have a 14 inch laptop and yeah. that's sort of how I feel every time I take my laptop out on a plane where I'm like terrified to, you know, I'm almost working with the display kind of yeah. angled down just in case the person in front of me uh, leans their chair back so that it doesn't crush the screen. <laughs> um, and I think, I think the, the tab S10 plus would fit that. So that's a total guess on my part uh, as to why they didn't upgrade the, the tab S9, but you know, having held the two next to each other, I, I sort of get it. The the Tab S9 almost feels more in line with the the iPad Mini, which got a very boring refresh this week. That's... That I think will continue the cycle of Apple being like, no one buys the iPad Mini. Let's not upgrade it for three years and then do the yeah. least amount we can with it. Bad bad upgrade for that one. But um, yeah, that's my thought. Tab S10 Plus. If you can get it on sale, if you can get the Tab S9 Plus on sale. They're good tablets at just I just at a thousand dollars, and that's without the keyboard case. It is difficult to recommend when the market is a wash with a thousand, eleven hundred, twelve hundred dollar options that are. I, th- I think you're right. Really there. This good. is the benefit for anyone listening to this. This is the benefit now is that that S nine is going to go down in price a lot quicker because this is the first yearly yeah. refresh we've seen yeah. in years. Like I can't remember the last time we saw. Uh, tab Tab S two. I had to go back through the entire the entire calendar when I was writing because I wanted that to be my intro and it was the first time there was like it was like I think 13 or 14 months between the tab the original like tab s mm. they had sizes they did like 10 point whatever in the tab s2 series and then since then it's been you know 16 to 19 months usually and this one is not exactly a year it's it's I think it's like 13 months 14 months but like it's close enough that I'm calling it an annual refresh cool should we talk phone yeah, the S24 FE, Stephen Radokia reviewed it for us. Hmm. I'm surprised that he was as positive on it as he was, because I know yeah. he covered the event for us, and I think walked away being pretty negative about it. And then once he got his hands on his own review unit, kind of warmed up to it a little bit. I think the display and the performance being solid, as well as like the cameras improving over the S23 FE, which he had also used, resembled a better buy compared to uh, uh, last year's phone. Yeah, yeah, we gave it eight out of ten in that review. Main main negative continues to be it is just too expensive for what it is. It is like it, it that is the real issue here. 
well, you'll get onto this in a moment. There's a solution there already, but um, <laughs> is, yeah, there th- <laughs> is there ever? Um, yeah, it's it is similar to similar to what we like as we say it's a much better upgrade than the s23 fe compared to the s23 series um it's a much much better choice in that way let jump up to price because that's that's the that's the main sticking point here and you, oh, okay. you've got you've got good advice for everyone listening yeah so i mean when this was announced i wrote our news post about it and i i yeah. was very i was also very negative in it because i was like for 650 dollars, which is up from last year it is pretty easy to find the S24 Plus, which is the same display size, but actually a smaller chassis because it's got smaller bezels, a better display, better cameras, all of that stuff, right? On sale through carrier deals. And I was like, I don't see a reason to buy the S24 FE when you can probably get a pretty good deal through Best Buy or Verizon or T-Mobile and so on. And yesterday I, I went, you know, we are two and a half weeks into the S24 FE being on store shelves and it is... uh <laughs> Let me pull up my post actually because I have the prices in there. It was it was free on T-Mobile with a new line or a trade in on an existing line. Uh, Verizon had it free for new customers or when adding a new line, which is not quite as good of a deal. And AT and T had it for six bucks if you have uh, a month for thirty six months if you have an unlimited plan. Yeah, those are steep discounts. Obviously, I think full price over thirty six months it would be like eighteen dollars. So if we're already seeing carrier discounts that are essentially like free or basically free every month with the right plan yeah i get it this is a thing where someone can walk in be like i want a phone like the s24 plus but i don't want to pay whatever the thousand dollars ends up being over the life of your your carrier plan and uh and can choose this one instead and you can get a pretty similar experience for a lot less money basically i think Mm. you have to buy it on a carrier plan to really get the benefit of that but i see why it exists we do get this weird period every time an FE phone comes around where we have like a month where we are ragging yeah. on it and every other, like every one of our peers is a similar sort of thing being like, this deal just doesn't make sense. Go buy an A-series phone. If you want a cheaper Samsung handset, you right. will get you will get a lesser experience, but it's not going to be that much lesser compared to the compared to the price difference. Go for an A55, go for, go for something in that sort of ballpark. And then these sort of things come around three weeks after, and, and it all makes sense again. So it's um, it's a strange. It's a str- I just feel like Samsung should come out of the door and and make that clear at, at launch. Essentially, I agree. Like, this should, if, this should be if they're going to be that quick, instantly. yeah, yeah. If, you know, get up on stage during their event and be like six hundred and fifty if you want it unlocked. If you don't want to have to deal with monthly payments, but if you're happy to deal with monthly payments, you know, it's, it's $5 a month or it's for 36 months or it's, it's, you know, free with a new line or something like that. I think that yeah. makes, um, Samsung has a lot of strong carrier partnerships and I think they should flex them more basically. Mm. So yeah, n- not a bad phone. Should we talk the next new phone? I was about to say that is the last Samsung phone of the year. And it is probably the last Samsung phone <laughs> of the year that you can buy, uh, or that any of us can buy. But it sounds like something else is coming. Uh, like we've heard about this for a little while, haven't we? Yeah, for months now. Basically, mm. since before the proper Galaxy Z Fold Six, to mm. be honest with you. And it sounds like either it will be called the Galaxy Z Fold Six Special Edition or just the uh, Galaxy Z Fold Special Edition. But we're looking at, if the rumors are correct, a thinner, larger, better aspect ratio, certainly with wider displays galaxy z fold model that is going to launch possibly next week on october 25th which is a a week from today as we're recording this it would be a better more modern device to compete with the pixel 9 pro fold which i think is probably the best (laughs) to be honest with you i think i think the pixel 9 pro fold is probably the best foldable you can buy right now and then the year old oneplus open and then the z fold 6 which is a problem when you're competing against a year old device and I, I am still pointing at that one and being like, I don't know, guys, I think it's better than the Z Fold 6. And don't forget a year old first gen device. Like that is the odd, yes. that's the odd yeah. element there is every other first gen foldable has been no recommend, cannot, cannot ever yeah. recommend that. The OnePlus is the, is the one, the one uh, unicorn. What, OnePlus is cheating a little bit because yeah. it, it's an Oppo, you know, they have their relationship with Oppo, which like had two foldables before you know, the one that was kind of the, the one plus open, but you're right. Like, and, and crucially, like the software was what made that shine and they got that out of the gate perfectly. The reason that we are, you know, kind of laughing about this instead of being like so excited about it 
is because it sounds like it's only going to be in China and, and South Korea. And I don't understand Samsung's strategy here. I have had months to think it through. The rumor that this would only be in those two regions has existed since at least July, I believe. And I don't understand it. I, James, can you make it make sense to me? Or are you in the same boat? Similar boat. I... I don't know if this is the test bed for the for the seven. I I'm not sure if this is what we're going to be seeing in a much bigger rollout. Come the actual, we we've heard time and time again, all through rumors, nothing official from Samsung, but we will see a overhaul of the design for the for the seven series when that comes around in 2025. I wonder if this is their way of using Korea as big as markets anyway, and China to be able to play around with that. Then maybe maybe they're not able to make enough stock for this. This won't be available as a worldwide launch. I wonder if this is their way of doing that and like making that making baby steps towards whatever comes next. There we're we're gonna be everyone's gonna be really, really watching for the seven series considering we both love the six series. We we literally reviewed them. We um we love the flip and the Z Fold six. But with the big caveat that this is just an iterative update and we need to see something new next year. So I wonder if this is the first step towards that. I hope it's more than this though, when it does come around in twenty twenty five. Again, we've not even seen what this new device is come next week, but yeah, I, I wonder if this is just their way of testing testing the waters a little bit and uh that Samsung's not really a company that's able to do that all that often. So it is potentially that. The only thing that, that disappoints me about that is that I guess it kind of shows that Samsung is in its current state a little seemingly terrified of change or, or trying something bold and new, mm. which is crazy when they were the company that like pushed forward into this market and, and kind of paved the road for other foldables. And now it's like we're talking about them being behind the competition and yeah. being a little scared of of launching a, a a wider release for this this new device that could lead into the Z Fold Seven next year. And it's confusing to me. I guess I I would like to see Samsung be a little braver and be a little bolder. And and this isn't really that. I I. You know, we we talked uh, last week or the week before about Samsung apologizing for. Mm. To, to shareholders and and you know uh, being like oh we haven't done enough to compete in the market basically and and i would just like to see them take some bigger swings i don't know maybe replace their settings menu with uh with ai you got it before me i was about to say exactly the same thing <laughs> <laughs> so yeah talking of bold swings uh one of the oddest rumors we've seen in months to be honest came out i think it was an et news re- uh, report earlier in the week one of the korean news news sources uh had a source yeah. that was claiming that samsung is thinking about getting rid of the settings menu within one ui it will be re- replacing it with ai elements so your settings will be able we we don't know anything more than that really in terms of an actual full report there's Will could correct me here. I don't think there's anything more within within the report than that. No, but I think it, it's it was pretty vague. Yeah, yeah. We're looking at, uh, I think the very early idea of a concept here, and maybe even this is the sort of thing that ends up leaking to the press to just test the waters, just just see how people react in that sort of way. But yeah, the idea is that AI will replace the settings menu. You'll be able to. I don't really understand how this would be visible. Maybe you're talking to Bixby or you're talking directly to Gemini on, on, on your handset and you're asking it to play around with the brightness of your phone. I can't imagine quick settings will be replaced in this element. I think we're just talking about the actual settings menu itself. Personally, I'd find that really frustrating if that were if that were to happen. If I'm not able to actually play around with specific settings, yeah, that's gonna that's gonna be a real a real, uh, a real problem for me. We we wrote an article earlier in the week. Path, uh, one of AP's writers, wrote a um, both a defence and a, the opposite of a defence to uh, to this idea that you can read on the site at the moment. And one of the things he was saying within that is that this could get to a point where AI is recommending settings changes to you. So similar to what we've already seen within some elements of software, it's turning around and saying the brightness of your phone has been up for too long. You're probably hurting your eyes then play around with this yeah but probably something smarter than that as well is the idea 
Personally, I think this is, if this is something Samsung's thinking about in the next couple of years, I think they are getting ahead of themselves. I think it's uh, it's something that Samsung has been very bullish on AI, as every single brand has had to be in the last couple of years. I think we're putting the cart before the horse a little bit here. I think this is something we need to yeah. like, I don't think it's ready for that. I don't think any, I don't think we're ready for that either, to be honest. I don't think trying to explain the settings menu anyway to someone who's not tech savvy is already difficult enough trying to add AI elements into that and removing the settings menu to be able to do that, that's a wild rumor. I have lots of thoughts mm. on this, and I don't want to waste too much time on it because this is just a rumor. I, I am looking at the ET News report right now. It is, as we said, it is very slim. I do agree with you that I think this was probably leaked on purpose to yeah. float the idea. I, first of all, I want to say that when I heard this, I, I genuinely had to go check the source because I was like... Mm. This sounds insane. I was like, I don't think we should cover this. Like, it sounds like someone just making stuff up. And then I saw it was ET News and yeah. I was like, oh, okay. Well, that's a real, that's probably real then. Which is just very funny of like how much disbelief I had at first glance. Mm. My guess would be that this would probably be more, as you said, like recommending changes as opposed to, you know, I, I, I can't imagine a world where like that settings gear icon just like disappears like fully especially yeah. from like samsung devices which have long been power user devices you know even as like certain hardware power user like sd card slots have disappeared that settings menu is deep right more than any other oem i would say it, it's it's almost a detriment a lot of the times mm. like when i'm looking for how to change certain things on i mean i just did this with the tab s10 plus i was trying to figure out something with the s pen and like so much of their language is buried behind buzzwords or specific branding for what they want you to think of something, right? Where I'm like, I can't figure out how to do the thing I want to do because I need to just enable and disable stuff until I figure out which of these settings yeah. Yeah. is the right one. And maybe AI makes that easier. I don't know. Like maybe I can ask Bixby to to figure out how to how to turn on like uh like quick actions with the S Pen. I, I don't know. You know, at the same time, I think really, I think anything to improve Samsung's settings menu would probably be good. But as you said, I don't think I trust any current AI chatbot, for lack of a better word, to like figure out what I want out of the settings on a phone. Like, yeah. I really think that like it would just mostly be me swiping pop ups away as they suggest, like turning on battery saver mode right now or turning down the resolution of my display to save battery like that's more of and and you can already do that but like i feel like it would just kind of be an annoying way to ask me to do more things to conserve energy or to to increase performance or whatever right like i have a hard time picturing a world where this improves my phone experience but we are enthusiasts by trade mm. maybe we are bad examples maybe this is a good thing for your mom who owns a samsung phone like, yeah i don't know I, uh, yeah actually as you've been saying this I've, I've kind of been sold a little bit more on that and in that way of it being like you know you know when you get ha handed a phone by someone who doesn't really understand technology and the brightness is so far up and and the the tech size is too big and th even they're struggling with that ai recommendations within there may may be an interesting idea just to be clear on this i think like I think this conversation has happened at Samsung. They have spoken about this as an idea. I do not think this is ever going to roll out and get rid of that settings icon, like you're saying. I think we I are agree. probably, maybe even One UI 7, but probably like a One UI 8 sort of thing where we will probably start to see that permeate through the settings menu. And if Samsung's to get there first, we're going to then see Google replicate that and we're going to see that across a bunch of different devices, I think. But yeah, the settings actual icon on your screen, if that goes away, I, I would, yeah, I'd be really surprised. Here's my other question, then we can we can move on to our grab bag. But how much of this is Samsung trying to respond to basically what we just talked about with Android 15 for half an hour, right? Of of software features mm. becoming stale or or boring in a way that like we have reached. You know, most most people, even enthusiasts, don't get excited about a Windows update, yeah. right? And like we have kind of hit that with Android. And I wonder if that's kind of the thinking behind the larger push in AI, really. It's just mm. like, we just need to keep making new things, even if they're a little half-baked. Like, is this just one of those things where it's like, 
they're just throwing darts at a wall and being like, okay, like what can we change now that will feel different from the experience you had yesterday so that you feel obligated to maybe buy a new device if your device is, you know, running out of support or something like that. Yeah. I think I think you could be right there and, and just an attitude of let's break some stuff and let's like let's play around with some things and let's try and make things work in a different yeah. in a different way that I just cannot see this working day one. Um this is gonna have to be a slow rollout. Let's run through some really quick stuff. Uh, mm. We reviewed the iPhone 16 this week. I did not review it. Uh, Nirav reviewed it for us, but I have I have one. Uh, I have the 16 and now the 16 Pro Max. I will be reviewing that one in the coming weeks. Uh, so so Daniel and I will presumably have a conversation about that phone, probably after the launch of the first Apple Intel that meets uh, features. But James, uh, are you tempted to to buy a, an iPhone 16 as our as our review headline suggests you might be? No, but this review isn't ready for me. Um, yeah, I'm. Yeah, uh, we gave it an eight point five. We gave it a classic eight, which is a, which is an, <laughs> a, a, a review score we give to too many phones. But um, I, I, yeah. there, I've argued this perfectly. I think I think this was valid in that way. Um, yeah, his headline on the review is that it should be the iPhone you should be tempted by. Not for me, but yeah, if you are if you are going to make that switch, this is probably the time to do it. You, this podcast has spoken about it lots in the last couple of weeks of everything within iOS 18 that is that has replicated the Android experience. This is, I hate to say it, but it is probably the point where if you do ever want to switch to iOS, it's probably going to be one of the easiest switches you've you've ever made. It will be, and I I will talk about this more in my yeah. uh, upcoming Pro Max review. But I also think it will drive you nuts. It, it's <laughs> almost it's one of those weird things. It is it is one of those weird. Uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is where it's like, yes, it feels more like Android than ever, yeah. but the limitations that are still there and the, I'll be polite and call it quirks. And if I was being less polite, I would call it bugs or just straight up like mm. bad decisions on how certain things work compared to Android, such as moving icons around the screen, I think would drive people nuts. The hardware is good though. It is such a, it's not a, an old school, traditional small phone. But compared to everything else I've used this year, it is. And there's something so fun about that, as I've said already in the show. But yeah, the software experience, like on one side, yes, it feels more like Android than ever. In some ways, more customizable than the Pixel, which is crazy. And in other ways, would have longtime Android users throwing it out the window, which is, yeah, lots more to say on, on iOS 18 in the coming weeks. That's what Android users really want at heart, though. They want they want to be frustrated by frustrated by their phones. So maybe maybe this is the time to switch. Not not really. Don't don't do it. Don't do that. It's an expensive phone. Yeah. It's eight hundred dollars. Also, I think I think people would be really pissed off about the sixty hertz screen, which I promise yeah, you would get true. used to. But also, I get it. For eight hundred dollars, it's a it's it's a problem. Twitter is changing. I'm calling it Twitter. Twitter is changing how mm. um, blocks work. Yeah. It already People has. can now, if you, it already has. Yeah, it has. Uh, anyone you've blocked can now see you again. They can't reply to you. They can't uh, like or retweet. I believe. I think all of those options are are grayed out. But anyone you've blocked, whether it's because they were posting spam or because they were harassing you, uh, can see your tweets again. Mm. This is uh, another thing trying to push me off of of, of Twitter. It's dangerous. It's it's uh, genuinely dangerous. It, there are it, it, people have people have got yeah. when was Twitter's launch? Two thousand six sort of time. People have got fifteen years plus of history on this platform and history with users of yeah. this platform. Like you, there are scenarios where blocking someone has been a, a actual sometimes life and death, but like it's been a it's been an element that, that is necessary and, and Google and Apple both understood that by putting block policies within within both of their app stores and you need to have those policies within within each app to be able to list on them. I yeah, this is exasperating, I find it. Like this is a this is a core feature that every every platform even something that isn't a literal verb like Twitter, like something that is as big as that should need to have this element within it and the the uproar that we've seen over the last week around it i think the uproar has actually been probably more muted than i would imagine it to be but i think that's because a lot of yeah. people have already left that platform if they cared about this as an element so um yeah i think this is a terrible decision one of the biggest terrible decisions we've seen since must took over yeah i agree i've gone to private just because i mm. don't need people that i've blocked previously and i i don't even expect to be harassed I, I've, I've never really been harassed 
particularly much on, on, on Twitter, but I, I, I don't need people that have walked to come back yep. into my life, as silly as it sounds like. But we are public facing names, right? It's not like we are just random people necessarily. Yep. We have online activity like this podcast like everything we write and i don't need that i don't really want it and it makes the platform less fun i don't know where to go really i uh, uh, ben shown at nine to five was like now you can come to threads finally because i barely post over there yeah. i do have an account and i'm like but threads is like just tech people it's like the fifth thing i use twitter for it's like i i'm there for like movie discussion and and, and sports discussion and politics discussion as bad as it can be yeah. and like a lot of that stuff is not on threads really i feel the same way about blue sky every time i've tried to use blue sky it's not quite what i'm looking for so i don't know yeah. uh maybe this is just me getting time back maybe <laughs> maybe it's an app that i i don't have to doom scroll through anymore not even doom scroll just like wasting time this is like this is time you can this is time you can use to work so that's great you can you can just write you can just write more <laughs> within it. and then that like whenever you like whenever you feel your thumb going towards the big x button on your on your phone you can like be like ah maybe i'll sit down and write another article that's that's just ideal <laughs> yeah it's 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 9 p.m on a friday <laughs> and i'm like james james said james said if i try to open twitter i gotta write an article <laughs> yeah you're, you're definitely uh, in the right headspace for that uh, yeah i'm i'm similar as well like i i love twitter i yeah. was like i wasn't there from the very beginning but i was very early early days on it i loved yeah. it as a platform i tried to make the move i tr I did set up threads on day one of threads i think i made a mistake there by connecting that with my instagram account i have still not really cleaned that up so who i follow on yeah, instagram messy. is a very different experience to who i follow on twitter and i want my twitter right. followers my, my twitter like who i follow on twitter to pour over into threads that would be what i prefer those are so different yeah. like i don't like uh, instagram remains as much as facebook or, or meta wants it to be me following meme pages mm. and other garbage they throw into my feed like that remains primarily how i stay connected to people from like college and that i've met in my life like right like i don't really use facebook at all anymore i have it I, I genuinely like this month has been the most i've opened facebook in probably three years and it's because i have an aunt who lives in florida and i just right. wanted to make sure she was doing mm. okay yeah uh and 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 the easiest way was to look at her posts on facebook mm. otherwise like and by 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 opening it the most i mean i think i opened it three or four times throughout hurricane milton yeah. and otherwise like i don't use that platform so instagram is really the best way to follow those people and Twitter is not that like most of my Twitter follows, certainly my favorite Twitter follows are people I've never met in real life who either I think are funny or I think are insightful and uh, they have not really made the jump. Um, if they have, they've all gone in different directions or they've stopped posting altogether, mm -hmm. which is a bummer. I don't know. It's just another, it's another nail in the com coffin. I don't know if it's the final nail in the coffin, but it is certainly, it is, it certainly feels like, a big one yeah yeah i, I just yeah. The, the the twitter blog thing i just really worry about it from a safety point of view i think it's a i think it's yeah a, i think it's a genuine concern as you were saying public facing elements again we're not big superstar celebrities or anything but there is an element there that if you needed to block someone and get rid of them and make sure they're not seeing what you're posting and not continuing to harass you that was a such a useful feature to be able to use and there's a reason these things are baked into the app store policies now as well um I think the most interesting part of this is going to be what comes from this. I think like wh whether there is any repercussions for X as a platform from it. We've seen some Agreed. some of these elements roll out on day one. They rolled out very, very quickly and then been chopped and changed after a later date. So this might there might be change to this. We might be talking about this again in the next couple of weeks. But yeah, yeah if you if you're the sort of person that's using X that you and you're concerned about this, then going private is the probably the first step. I appreciate that you call it X. I just can't bring myself to do it. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I, I know it's correct, but I just can't do it. I don't know why. I don't know why. It's a, it's it's sort of got in my brain in the last month for some reason. Like it's been over a year now, and it's the uh, it just like just clicked for some reason. I, I don't like. I don't like it. I, I don't like it. But it's no. but it, it but it's it's coming out of my mouth now as X rather than Twitter. <laughs> I um God, I hate I hate to say that this is like a good thing. There was like one good change from the rebrand. Mm. And it's that like 
there are lots of websites I go to that start with the letter T, right? And in fact, like going Absolutely. to Twitter or twitch.com mm. was annoying, like in the browser, right? Like you had to type T W I T and then either C or T to go to a different, to go to one of those two sites in, in my like desktop browser. Mm. I don't go to a lot of sites that start with X. <laughs> yeah. uh, in fact, there's really only one other subcategory of site I can think of that starts <laughs> with X. Uh, so, uh, and there, it's not in my browser history. That's, that sounds bad. What I'm saying is I don't go to those sites. Not that, whatever. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, Kindles. Yeah. There's new Kindles. Um, uh, there's a color Kindle. It's really expensive. Yeah. It's cool. All of the the book talk influencers are going to have this and it's going to look really nice on their on their videos. Um but I just can't bring myself to pay $280 so that I can, you know, I I'm not a comic reader. Like if I was maybe it, maybe it'd be different, but um you know, I would love to see the cover pages in color, but mm. uh otherwise I'll I'll probably have to wait for this to get cheaper and like the technology to get cheaper over the, you know, next 5 years for it to come down to like the sub two hundred dollars space before i buy a color kindle this took amazon so long like i I still don't really so long i really don't understand why this why this did take so long because again what we just talked about there of twitter being a verb like people i think that is kindle is like second nature what people mean whenever they're talking about an e-reader as well and and like and they are probably I'm I'm not sure if I'm going to say, like if this is accurate or not, but they're one of the last brands at least to actually make the move over to color to make that like to make that allowance. We've seen I, they might be yeah. unless uh, I can't search Nook color. That's a real <laughs> that was a tablet from a decade ago. Jesus, <laughs> um, more a decade and a half ago. But yeah, I I, I don't remember if the Barnes and because Barnes and Noble I think still makes Nooks, right? Yeah. Do they not? Yeah, they do. Yeah, so I, I don't know if they have a color one, but mm. like obviously uh, Kobo definitely does and so on. So to be honest, the one I'm most excited about, and I, I won't buy it because my Kindle is not particularly old, the base Kindle model, yeah. the $110 one in that matcha color looks so good. Yeah, it does. It looks really nice. It's really pretty. Uh, and I, I wish the paper white, there are colors for the, the paper white, but it's only the back of it. The front is still all black. I don't know. I, I kind of wish... Um, that they were all like different colors. Like I, I don't see a reason as to keep Kindles in a boring black shade. I would like to see um, Amazon kind of expand this out to make things a little more fun in the same way we think about phones. But um, if, if smartphones are any indication, that's not going to happen. If anything, it feels like e-readers are better with colors, aren't they? Like you do end up seeing these more like yeah. bold and bold and brush ones. Um, I, I would just, I just wait a couple of weeks where you, you know, people are loving this color. We're seeing people talk about it everywhere. I think you're going to see cases yeah. for your current Kindle model oh, yeah. is going to like become that color ASAP. Someone is already working on that behind the scenes, even if it wasn't already a color available. So wait, wait until that, I think like that's, yeah, that's a, just grab, grab a case at some point in the future. There's a new paper white. There's mm. a new a new scribe. I don't have a lot to say about about those beyond that. But that's it's kind of the color one is the is the big deal. Yeah, this came as a little bit of a surprise. I think I feel like every Kindle launch does come as a big surprise. Like we we always we always get blindsided by by a Kindle launch. We never really yeah. expect them to. Expect They're so them irregular. To yeah. They just do it when they feel like yeah. it. Like there's no rhyme or reason to. We had a couple. We had a couple leaks. I don't think we had a leak for the right. color one. We had a, a, a leak for the base for that matcha. Yeah. But like otherwise, and then like two hours before Amazon accidentally published information mm. on, on their lineup. But like that was only a couple out. It was it was like 6 a.m. or something Eastern time. So by the time I like really logged on for the day, I think yeah. they had been officially announced. Other than small refreshes, like maybe different colors or something. I don't think we get anything new um, from here for couple of years probably yeah and this is the first time in a yeah. while that amazon's done such a huge wave of kindles all at the same time we usually see each model being replaced at different moments usually not usually a full-blown four all at the same time um and again yeah. we, we are now getting a brand new one rest in peace the oasis i think is the last thing to say um the oasis is yeah. is no more always a really really tough recommend i loved using those products i absolutely like they were always the kindles i would go towards they were, they'd be the e-readers i would go towards but again, I'm not spending money on them, and it was always a tough thing to actually recommend to anyone, even if they were a, so a, expensive. Yeah, if they were a, a really, really huge e-reader enthusiast, it was still 
Because the, the, the paperweight is minor. exactly the paperweight yeah. is like the perfect Goldilocks element, and it just wasn't really worth it for that. Like the smooth bezel, lovely, and the buttons, brilliant. That was it. Like it wasn't, it, and like the um, the way you could hold the Oasis was was brilliant as well. Um, yeah, but yeah, I agree. It's it's gone, and it's uh, it is no more. And Sam, uh, sorry, uh, Amazon have not fully confirmed yet that, that it is the end from what i've read so far this week but yeah. they, they've said it's the end of this model and they are they are selling through the end of that stock but it sounds like they've already sold out that to me sounds like that is just the end here and we're not going to see another oasis product I, it it feels like the color soft kind of took a spot yeah. as that like premium it's waterproof it's got a color display which i think is going to to be honest like pull more people in than than buttons it, it's, it's kind of a bummer to say that because mm. i I always wanted an Oasis because of the buttons, mm. but like, I think people care more about that and don't really, I think normal users don't care about the touchscreen, which works fine compared to like just using a, uh, you know, the, the flashiness of a, of a color display. I think, I think it's so much more eye popping. So. Color soft is a bad name though, right? Where, where does that, I don't really understand mm. that yet. Yeah, it's bad. I, I like, I think they sh- maybe should have called the, the technology color soft. I think that would be fine. Like if they call if they were like it's got a color soft uh, an Amazon color soft display or something. Mm. Kindle but, color, Kindle color, done. Yeah, bring back like a oh they should have done it with like the Game Boy color font the the way that Nintendo did color where it was like it looked like it was written in crayon or whatever. That's what they should have done. They should have also should have had as many color options as the Game Boy color. Yeah, and they should put the name Fire in there just to confuse us one more time. <laughs> I still, I still, call, I still call everything Kindle Fire before I then like have to go back through it and delete it and be like, no, Fire is Fire isn't yeah, related to Kindles anymore. It's been almost a decade. I think the tablet lineup dropped Kindle in twenty, the word Kindle in twenty fifteen with the twenty fifteen lineup, and it is twenty twenty four, and the vast majority of people are still like, yeah, Kindle Fire, yeah, I get it. It's crazy how much they stuck. It, they almost maybe should have kept that branding around because mm. it was clearly it clearly caught on so like i don't know maybe they maybe a missed opportunity i love those scenarios we have we have a streaming service in the uk if, if we have any uk listeners there they know what i'm going to talk about instantly um for our uh like our third our third biggest broadcaster in the uk so it's the bbc then we have itv and then the, f- the fourth one is channel four which is aimed yeah. at like a slightly younger audience and it does some slightly like edgier p- programming in that sort of way they had a streaming service i think they were the first to have a streaming service even before the bbc i, I could be wrong with that but it was very very early days and they called it 4od it was for on demand and then they changed the name to that i think about 15 years ago and i implore anyone to try and remember what the name of that service is i use it multiple times a week and i still refer to it as 4od and so so i i do know it is called all four that is the that is the new name the new name that came in 10 plus years ago for this streaming service but yeah it's something that people will not understand unless you call it 4od i love those scenarios where some brand is completely stuck and and no matter what people do they try and try and unpick it and it just doesn't work james i'm gonna crush you because (laughs) They they rebranded it again. What did they? And two years ago, on November second, twenty twenty two, Channel Four announced plans to rebrand its on demand service All Four as Channel Four, which ha- and it happened in spring of twenty twenty three. So it's been almost two years. That didn't. That's not. Since it was on, called All Four. That's not happened on my TV. I man, I like look. I don't have it right. Like I'm just on <laughs> Wikipedia, but like I don't. <laughs> It's uh yeah, it if you look at um I have a press release from them, uh dated November second, twenty twenty two. That I'm go. going to, to send to you on uh on, on, on Slack. But like um <laughs> my, my point still my point still stands though, though. It's just like these no, you, just you like, are two yeah, names behind yeah. and you're still like, of course, of course it's called we all know it's called all four if I think about it, but it's four O D yeah. and it's like it's not even all four anymore. Yeah. I can't believe Twi- I can't believe I started calling Twitter X before I remembered what to call <laughs> what to call the streaming service like that. Like it's something's clearly broken there. Oh my god. Okay, um, <laughs> we've run long. I think we'll we'll leave it there. Uh, except for we have to do um, mm. what's making you happy this week. I prompted you like an hour before our record time with this, James. Uh, so I ask you, what's uh, what's making you happy this week? Can I can I do? 
I'm going to do another streaming recommendation. I've started doing these in my Absolutely. newsletter in the last like couple of months, and I'm, I'm getting quite into it now. It's quite nice to do this. Yeah. Recommend little world things. Um, this is something that annoyingly isn't available in the US at the moment, and I'm hoping it will eventually come to the US because it's proving to be a bit of a hit in the UK. Um, we have a new cozy murder drama that's on the BBC in the UK called Ludwig, um, like like Beethoven's first name. Um, the concept is uh, if you've if anyone's ever watched Jonathan Creek, which is a like absolute classic uk cozy murder sort of show um like mm. a, an absolute yeah an absolute classic it's a similar sort of vibe to that the idea is that uh david mitchell one of our best comedians that's yeah. ever come from the uk I was about to say. is uh he's exactly my sense of humor entirely he uh is a uh crossword puzzler he like makes crosswords for the guardian newspaper and he has a twin brother a identical twin brother who's a police officer his identical twin brother goes missing and then he has to become the the cop uh well uh, while he's literally just a cross word setter um and it's his ridiculous brain making puzzles trying to solve the puzzles of murders it is the most ridiculous and silly show but i am four episodes deep into it and it has been an absolute joy this week to uh especially our weather in the uk has just been absolutely awful so it's been really nice to like really cozy up on an evening and uh and watch one of these yeah it's currently just available on bbc iplayer in the uk if you have sneaky vpn ways to watch you'll be able to watch it um but it's uh i don't think there's any confirmation yet of it ever coming to the us but yeah that's something that's made me happy this week this feels like something that will just like one day pop up on netflix mm. or, or prime video or something like with no fanfare it will just be there in, like next april or something that feels like what this is but yeah because like you know david mitchell is a bit of a name here i guess like i i feel like if you talk to like comedy nerds at the very least they mm. would know they know who david mitchell is so like i i i could see this happening how about you what's made you happy this week i'm months late to this I'm I'm going to give a recommendation that everyone's going to be like, yeah, will like we we knew we've been on this, but it took me reviewing the the tab S10 plus and thinking about what would be a good thing to have on that big 12.4 inch uh, display, and that's Bellatro. Oh yeah, I'm hooked, man. It it I bought it. So this is during the summer the summer Steam sale. I bought it on my Steam Deck because everyone loved it. Played a couple rounds. Um, I maintain that that opening tutorial is terrible it like it is one of those games that like you just need to play it to figure out how it works and like them throwing everything at you throughout the first like two or three mm. like hands like with like instructions i get why they do it they get it out of the way quick enough but it it really did not make me particularly i was like oh this is too much on like a thursday night put it down and then like i think i ended up refunding it i was like ah eh, didn't click for me guess it's not for me the other part I think is that like that game is so much better with with a touchscreen. Yeah. Like it, with controls, it just it doesn't feel it, it doesn't feel bad. But like you need you either need a mouse or a a, a touchscreen. I think playing it on the I've, I've played it a little bit on like my Pixel Nine Pro. It's a little that phone is a little too small to be honest for it. You need a bigger screen because some of the just the descriptions are small. Um, but on on the Tab S10 Plus, it's like perfect. I have lots of work to do on the plane on the way to uh summit and i'm going it's going to take every i'm gonna to have to fight every urge to just open bellatro and play eight hours of bellatro from dallas to to maui you've you've um, found your twitter replacement you don't need to you don't need to a little about bit twitter. like truly like because it's it's not a game that you want to like it's not even like a podcast game like i've 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 played it while watching tv and that's a, you know i can kind of do it but like because you are constantly trying to read what the description is and then think about how the jokers that you've drawn and, and the other cards that you have, like the tarot cards and everything, like plays into your hand to, to score points. You have to be kind of surprisingly into it or you will not, your run will peter out um, halfway through the, the rounds. Th this is true. I finally beat my first run uh, last night. So <laughs> it took like two because I picked it up during my week off, so it took like two and a half weeks of me playing that to finally, on and off, to, to finally beat a, a hand. I, I, I built the right level of combinations and had the right amount of focus to finally finally do it. I've, I've not played it yet, and I will, I will do it, I promise. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm literally going to download it. Mm, it'll, it, it'll uh, yeah, it's like 10 bucks on Android, yeah. which is like not that bad. Like I have, I have no, I truly, pricing. I've been playing it basically every night for like, at least an hour i've i've gotten my money's worth out of it yeah man it's uh they weren't kidding all the all the press about it uh earlier this year was correct that game rules 
So I have a friend that I'm literally meeting a friend for dinner tonight, and then he just continues to say Bellatro, like like literally in a really yeah. deep voice goes Bellatro like that. Can you explain that concept to me before I end up playing it? Why, why does he do that? Like, <laughs> is that is that what happens know. when you win? Is that what happens when you win? Or I don't think I didn't hear it. I, t- I okay, interesting. <laughs> I kind of don't know why. Right, We're gonna we, find this out together. It, Why is it called Volatro? This is this might be a poker thing that I don't know. Yeah, Volatro is a professional jester or buffoon in ancient Rome. Ah, okay, cool. We should so, rename this um, podcast. Yeah, I. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. Um, you can don't follow us on Twitter. I guess mm, um, we're James you. calls it X. This is like I think this is James's problem is that like he always just has to do things a little bit differently. Like when I found out he still used uh, buttons on his pixel, I don't anymore. Gestures. I don't anymore. I just do, yeah, because I... we shamed you out of it. Like <laughs> truly, like like Manuel and I sat there in Barcelona just like making fun of you until you changed it. <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah, that was uh, that was uh, bordering on unprofessional. <laughs> A little bit, a little <laughs> bit. There were drink, there were drinks involved. I think if if drinks hadn't been involved, it would have it would have went away. But like we were already a couple of beers in, and it didn't <laughs> stop there. So, um, yeah. Uh, read everything on the site, show notes uh, in your podcast app. Um, everything we talked about this week. Um, James, do you have anything cool? Com- you already recommended your newsletter, so everyone should mm. go sign up for James's newsletter. Um, I filled in one week, uh, and I don't think I did as good of a job as he does, because he's actually really good at writing this newsletter, so... Um, oh, thank you, that's very you kind. You don't did. already... Uh, you, I, you, it was you fine. Do. You did, but your, you did yours go. are like... Uh, I don't know, you make it look effortless in a way <laughs> that I did not find it effortless, is what I would say. Thank you, that's um, very kind. Yeah, um, anything else people should uh, follow you on besides just, like, the site? yeah just go sign up for that newsletter please that's my that's my main creative endeavor at the moment for for what i do an ap yeah. I, need, I need to write more on the site but um yeah go to go to uh android police newsletters put that into google you'll find our page we have three newsletters at the moment one there's a daily news roundup one that's a weekly deals roundup from our managing reviews editor dominic preston and then my sunday newsletter which is essentially the five things that we've published on the site that week that you need to know about is the logic so um if you're going to sign up in the next couple of hours you're going to find a uh, you're going to find an android 15 one in your inbox but you're more likely going to be listening to this and finding the one yeah. next week so um yeah i'm not sure what yeah. that'll be yet. um speaking of next week uh i will be in i will be in maui for mm. and summit uh I, I don't believe i have a podcast interview lined up this year which we've done in the last two years that if you're a listener maybe i don't know maybe you're happy about that i'm not sure if they were ever interesting or not uh i'm, I'm too hard on myself um, but we we're gonna do something. I'm gonna bring my microphone. I'll I'll try to record with Daniel at some point remotely. Nice. Um, it's always remote. It's it's always remote. I don't know why I said that. Um, but you're but you you're remote. I mean. Like uh, like that. Would I'm be, remote. I'm yeah. not sitting in my office. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And and you know what? We made it through uh this entire episode without a lost reference. So I do need to reference, of course, that lost shot in Hawaii. Um. And that uh, not in Maui, but I'm I'm gonna. I think that's good enough. Um, Daniel has presumably made it this far in the episode and been like, thank God they didn't do this. And uh, hopefully this is making him really mad right now. That would be, that would be my hope. Just us driving around in a Dharma van. That's, that's what Snapdragon said. Uh, there we go. There we go. Let me tell you, literally all, I made a, I made a fairly dark joke about um, the plane crashing last night because Maddie is coming with me. Uh, and Maddie was like, yeah, but then we could be, be like lost. And so I was like, yeah, or we'd just be dead, probably. It'd probably be more like that. But And then I made a joke that they were dead the entire time. It was just like Lost. That's not true. They were not dead the entire time. I'm, anyway. Um, spoilers for Lost, that they weren't dead the entire time? No, Is that a spoiler? You're fine. You're I don't fine. know. <laughs> uh, I just encourage people to watch. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's on Netflix or... Um, I don't know. I guess probably just Channel 4, obviously. In the, no, not, I don't know where it is in the UK. Yeah. Um, Disney Plus. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Disney, yeah, there we go. I, of course. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for our listening, and we will be back uh, next week. Daniel will probably be back next week, and James, we will have you on again. See you again soon. More regularly, like we're doing this. Yeah, yeah, let's make yeah exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, have a good week, everyone. Bye, Bye. everyone.